so uh, let's get started. Uh, so today's session is about uh, fungal infection. It includes three important uh, infections, which are classified uh, based on the, the ana anatomical sites, actually two of them. Uh, they are uh, classified based on the site of infection, that's anatomical site. This is the superficial mycosis and uh, cutaneous uh, mycosis. And then we will also uh, talk about uh, opportunistic uh, mycosis. Uh, so this is outline of uh, today's lecture. And uh, uh, to be clearer, we'll start uh, by revising some aspects of um, fungal, uh, fung fungus in general. But let's, let's define mycosis. So mycosis is a singular uh, form of uh, mycosis, and uh, it's an infection caused by a fungus. And uh, mycosis can be uh, classified into different groups, at least into four types, based on the type and degree of tissue involvement. We have uh, superficial, superficial mycosis, cutaneous mycosis, subcutaneous mycosis, and systemic or deep infections. Uh, in today's session, we'll talk about superficial uh, mycosis and uh, cutaneous mycosis. Uh, the rest, the two, subcutaneous and systemic uh, mycosis, will be discussed later in the infectious disease module. So we'll focus in, on the uh, two of them today. And fungi, in general, they can be grouped into two based on virulence. So we have uh, primary pathogens and uh, uh, opportunistic pathogens. So primary pathogens are more virulent and they can cause disease in uh, normal individuals, whereas opportunistic pathogens or fungi, they cause disease in immunocompromised people. So they do have uh, a bit of uh, uh, low virulence. Uh, can anyone uh, just say something and it would be good if I can hear you. A lot. Yeah, okay, okay, okay. Great. So let's get back. So can you see it? Okay, okay. So uh, then uh, uh, let's revise a bit about uh, fungus morphology in general. So fungi, they can be classified into four based on their morphology. The first one, the first groups are yeasts, and these are unicellular uh, bodies, and they could be like round, like this, or oval uh, in, in shape, and um, they can be uh, cultured on mycological media, and they produce actually smooth, uh, creamy colonies uh, when grown. Uh, examples include the Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Uh, this is also called brewers and uh, baker's yeast. This is a uh, yeast used in for fermentation of uh, like injera and uh, bread. Uh, brewers yes, uh, brewers uh, yeast, and this is an example of uh, a yeast. We have also Cryptococcus neoformans as an example in the yeast group. The other uh, groups of fungi are uh, molds. So molds are filament fungi, and they are multicellular. As you can see, you see the filament. So the yeasts are unicellular, and they are oval, circular bodies. But these are multicellular uh, organisms, and they produce such structures, filament structures. And uh, 
uh, they could be like branching clamines just like this. And uh, they reproduce by formation of different spores. So spores, you know, in spores in, in fungi, they can be used as a, a dispersal, dispersal unit and they are also involved in the reproduction. In bacteria, uh, spores are important uh, to uh, survive harsh environments, whereas in this case, they are, they are, they are uh, involved in the reproduction. So over here, you can see the growth of a mold on a tomato, so uh, you, can, you can see uh, the molds uh, just like this, but the structures, they can be seen only using microscope, the detailed structures. So both molds and uh, yeast, they are microscopic, they are not macroscopic. Uh, even though you can see uh, the mold just like this, it doesn't mean that they are macroscopic because you cannot differentiate the fine structures using your necktie. Uh, the examples include you have dermatophytes, aspergillus, and the likes. The another group of uh, fungi based on morphology is the yeast like uh, uh, fungi. So these uh, groups they grow partly as yeasts and partly as elongated cells or uh, uh, resembling hyphae. And uh, they are called pseudo hyphae. Over, over here, you can see the, these uh, structures, right? Right, so this is a yeast, it's another yeast. So this uh, structure is formed by uh, the combination of uh, different yeasts and it actually looks like hyphae, but it's not a true hyphae. Because the hyphae is uh, uh, created by the filamentary structure, which are uniformly like, like flat and something like that. But this one is a yeast budding and uh, uh, accumulating one on the other and creating a kind of structure. And that's why it's called uh, pseudo hyphae. It's not a true hyphae. The best example is Candidia albicans. So it's the best example of uh, uh, fungi with, with uh, sorry, this like structure. The another group of uh, fungi are dimorphic uh, fungi. Have you heard about uh, dimorphic uh, fungi or fungi? Anybody who can uh, tell us something about this? Yes. Dimorphic. Okay. Yeah, exactly, Brooke. Thank you. It can be both yeast and uh, mold, depending on the environmental conditions. So, dimorphic fungi are fungi that, that, which can assume both yeast and mold forms, depending on the uh, temperature and other conditions. So. They become molds at uh, environmental temperature. That means in the environment, and they become yeasts uh, uh, in the body uh, around 37 degrees centigrade. So most fungi causing systemic infections actually they are dimorphic. Uh, this includes like Histoplasma capsulatum, Blastomyces dermatitidis, and the likes. So let's get back to our topic. And uh, let's talk about uh, superficial mycosis. So, as its names, as its name implies, uh, superficial mycosis are fungal infections confined to the, to the outermost layer of the skin. It normally uh, affects the hair and the hair shaft and nails, and uh, they are largely cosmetic problems. What does it mean, cosmetic problems? Cosmetic problems. Anyone comment on it? What does it mean? Exactly, bro. Thank you very much. So just a, a problem uh, uh, related to the beauty 
they could disfigure like the beauty, but uh, that's not a big thing. Uh, but uh, still, there are there are problems. So the common types include the Kenya versicolor, Kenya nigra, palmaris, and Kenya pedra. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about uh, each of them. So let's start with the uh, Kenya versicolor or uh, Pitreasis versicolor. This is a common superficial infection, and it affects the skin. And the causative agent is a Malassezia species. So Malassezia species uh, is the most important causative agent of uh, this Kenya uh, versicolor. There are several species under the Malassezia group, but the most important ones include Malassezia pepper, Malassezia globosa, and uh, Malassezia risterica. So this is a lipophilic yeast, and uh, it's actually normal for uh, the human and the animal skins. So you can get it uh, from the from the endogenous part. So what does lipophilic mean? Lipophilic. Lipophilic. Anybody who can comment on it? So you know it. So uh, the term, uh, yeah, exactly. Uh, thank you, Alec. 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 Yeah. Thank you. So, lipophilic, as it as its name implies, uh, loves lipid. So it feeds on the. Uh, remnants from the skin, the liquid remnants, and that's why it's confined to the skin. So normally, yeah, um, it causes a, this disease, pityariasis, versicolor, or tenia, versicolor. But it can also cause other diseases, like chaborhoic dermatitis, dandruff, and uh, mal malassezia folliculitis. So sorry for the pronunciation. <laughs> So in the Saberhoic uh, dermatitis, there is a sort of inflammation, you know? Uh, and there is, a, there is a, like a, a bit of a damage. But in, uh, in uh, Kenya versicolor, there is no inflammation, just a superficial uh, infection uh, of a cosmetic problem. But in case of Saberhoic dermatitis, uh, there could be like an inflammation and it's, it actually occurs in immunocompromised people. And nowadays, uh, this uh, Malassezia species, they are associated with systemic infections. Previously, they were known like causing uh, the superficial infection, but now there are several reports that they are also causing uh, the systemic infections, uh, particularly among the immunocompromised uh, people and neonates. So over here, you see the Stain the structure of the Malassezia species. Malassezia. So let's look. Let's see the epidemiology. So you, it is actually straightforward. You can read it. Uh, it's worldwide in its distribution, and uh, the source of impression could be endogenous. So we said that it's normal flora of the skin. So when and when there are changes in the skin uh, hemostasis, there could be an infection. So in that case, the source of infection can be called as endogenous. And uh, of course, it's less contagious to, to other humans. So human to human transmission is really rare. But as it is a normal flora, part of the normal flora of the skin, uh, it can cause infection uh, by, from that skin part. And the, the, the predisposing factors include the immunosuppression, like if there is steroid therapy, if the, if the patient is uh, uh, infected with HIV. And then I guess that, that will predispose for fungal infections, not only the Kenya versicolor, but it can also happen in, uh, in normal individuals, by the way. Prohagen is another important uh, predisposing factor. So sweet and greasy skin, uh, will be highly susceptible uh, to this uh, uh, Malassezia species. And if there are chronic bacterial infections, then the 
infection by this malassezia species can happen as a, as a secondary infection. Uh, so the clinical manifestation, as, as you can see over here, uh, it creates a sort of a, like uh, fawn colored macules. So over here, it's called a fawn um, colored, you know, just like this. And it could be hyper or hypopigmented. Uh, the skin, I mean, could be hyper or hypopigmented depending on the skin color and for blacks and for whites. So, the lesions are well dem demarcated, as you can see here. Uh, so, over here. So it's actually paleness and there is no itching. And let's talk about the laboratory diagnosis. So, when you talk about the laboratory diagnosis, it's, it's always important to take the appropriate specimen, right? So, in this case, we take skin scrapings so from the affected area, and then we have to use 10% potassium hydroxide. What's the, import the importance of 10% uh, potassium hydroxide? Importance. Anybody? So we use 10% potassium hydroxide whenever we. Uh, Exactly. So, bro, thank you very much. So, yeah. So, uh, when you like, 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 when you take the sample from the skin, there are uh, keratin and other materials, so they need to be uh, digested so that we can see the fungus clearly. So, for uh, Malassezia species. Uh, after the treatment with potassium hydroxide, uh, you will see such a structure under a microscope after seeing a sort of uh, like processing stain. So as you can see here, this structure seems like like spaghetti and meatball appearance. So the spaghetti, such structures is for hypi and the meatballs uh, are for yeast. So the, the mixture of the hypi and the yeast is uh, can be found, uh, yeah, at the same time. And the culture can be done, but uh, it's rarely done. And we can use a Sauraudis dextrosaca. This is the most important mycological media used for cultivation of uh, fungal pathogens, Sauraudis dextros agar. And in some cases, we have to use uh, antibiotics like chlorohexamide and chloramphenicol. And this is to prevent contamination by bacteria. This, 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 these antibiotics will kill the bacteria and then the fungus will grow. The treatment, so topical azoles uh, or just shampoo can be used. But whenever there is a, a widespread infections or disseminated infections, in case of the, let's say, if, uh, if um, a systemic infection happens and uh, the oral ketoconazole or ethraconazole should be used uh, based on the recent guidelines, actually. So these things actually are going to deal with the clinical part, and I will be focusing on the, micro, on the microbiological aspects. Another superficial uh, fungal infection is tenia uh, nigra. And uh, this is a chronic superficial uh, infection of the palmas and soles. It's a real, it's actually rare, but it happens. And it's caused by a fungus, black fungus called Horte uh, wernicki or Exophiella wernicki. Uh, Exophiella wernicki is a, is a causative agent. And the, this fungus is a black fungus and it's called Dematiaceous, dematiaceous uh, fungus. Dematiaceous means it's not just just uh, pigmented. It's the name for pigmented fungi, and it's under the phylum Mascomycota. So the epidemiology you can read it again, and the transmission uh, it's uh, be like so traumatic inoculation to the skin because prevalent in soil in the environment, so it's, it's a contamination from the environment. So it's uh, exogenous. And the excessive sweating is an, an, an important predisposing factor for uh, tenia nigra. nigra. 
So when you see the clinical manifestations, as you can see, you'll see the brown black macules, just like this. It can, be, can happen on the palms or on the soles, and it's well-defined, uh, dark patch, just like this. No inflammation, it's a superficial infection. And uh, when this is a laboratory diagnosis, you can take, again, uh, skin scraping this and uh, di direct microscopy after thin person hydrogen uh, KOH uh, treatment can be used. And the culture can be used, it can be grown on sour or disturbed Chodaga. The treatment can be, uh, these things can be used. Another uh, is a tinea pedra, and this is a uh, um, chronic infection of the, the, the hair shaft. So the etiology agents for tinea pedra include uh, the pedra horti, causing black pedra, and trichosporon species, causing the white pedra. Have you heard about those things, by the way? Some told me a color. Anybody who can comment? Anybody? What does Pedro means? Pedro means Pedro. You want to get to the right? That is Buzuma because Pedro me bad in the right genomes. So, yeah. Uh, Let's talk about the black pedra. This effect is uh, uh, the scalp hair, just like this, and uh, it's caused by pedra horti. And you'll see like dark hyphae, just like this. And uh, the fungus, uh, pedra horti, it exists in the soil, so infection would be like exogenous uh, contamination from the soils. It's common in tropical and subtropical environments, and, uh, it affects both sexes, uh, and, and it's uh, in this case it's contagious. It's highly uh, transmittable from human to human. So the, an epidemics can happen in in, uh, in uh, I mean epidemics uh, epidemics can happen in families. So the predisposing factors include poor hygiene and long hair is really the most important predisposing factor for having black hair. Uh, this is a clinical manifestation. So over here, you see like hard black nodule, just like this. You can read it. And the laboratory diagnosis, same procedure can be used. Direct microscopy after 10% production microscope treatment can be used. And culture can be also used on the mycological media. The treatment, hair cut, hair, hair cut, sorry, hair cut and, uh, and the other procedures can be used. White pedra, uh, this is uh, uh, also a superficial infection uh, of the hair shaft. In this case, it can uh, affect the scalp, axial, and facial, facial hair, uh, including the scalp hair. So in the case of black pedra, that's most commonly associated with the uh, scalp hair. But in this case, other parts of uh, uh, other hair parts in different body can be affected, like scalp, I mean, axial, like facial, and genital hair can be affected. So it's, uh, it's like widespread, you know. The, the range is broader here compared to the black pillar. And this is caused by trichosporon species. Um, and uh, trichosporon bengali uh, is, uh, is uh, the most important causative agent of white pedra. So it's a yeast-like fungus. Then we already discussed what, what yeast-like fungus mean previously. So this is a yeast-like fungus under the Pazidium mycota, and uh, you can get it in soil. So in this, the infection in this case could be like exogenous or endogenous, because it can be, it's also part of the normal flora of the skin, so, and the respiratory tract, so the infection could be in that case endogenous, but still you can get it from uh, the environment, so the soil, so that's exogenous. So both exogenous and endogenous 
and fishing would be possible in case of strike of poor fishes. Uh, guys, any question or manurachun in this Any question? I have to say something, guys. Okay, thank you, Brooke. You are uh, reflecting, but the others they are keeping silent, and I don't know. It's really difficult. Okay, thank you, <laughs> thank you. Okay, thank you. Yeah. So uh, uh, we have the black bead line, the white bead run with a uh, with a. Uh, a bit of similar manifestation, but uh, affecting different uh, uh, hair parts. So you will see, like, there is an epidemiology you can read. Long hair, again, here is an important, important predisposing factor. So the clinical mass manifestations, you will see, like, white to brown swelling along the hair strand. So that's why it's called white pedra, because the swellings here are the whitish. Whereas in the previous one, the swellings are black. So in both cases, you see that like they look like a stone. That's why it's called a piedra. Piedra in Spanish means the stone. So you will see such structures under the microscopy. Uh, the microscope, I mean. In this case, the nodules are actually adhering to the hairs loosely, loosely and uh, no pathological changes are, are elicited. So they are superficial infections. So there are no like inflammations in, in the in the scalp and the legs. The white pedra, the laboratory diagnosis, uh, the same procedure can be applied. You can use direct microscopy, but it should be after what? 10% hydro um, potassium hydroxide to uh, digest uh, creating material from from the hair. So you will see like budding yeast or arthroconidia, you know. Arthroconidia is for the hyphae. It's a type of uh, spore. Like fragmented spores are called arthroconidia. They're nothing. The fragmented uh, spores. So it can be also cultured on a mycological media without uh, cycle of hexamide actually, because uh, this uh, antibiotic uh, here is uh, the growth of trichosporin species, so we haven't, we don't have to use a, a cyclohexamide whenever we culture the specimen for the diagnosis of uh, the white piedra. Don't forget this one. The treatment same procedure can be applied is straightforward. Can read it. Sorry, this is a very ah uh, yeah. Now correct it, sorry. So let's talk about cutaneous mycosis. Uh, so here there are terms like dermatophytosis and dermatomycosis. So dermatophytosis is an, an infection, a fungal infection. It's also called a ringworm infection. And is it, it is caused by Dermatophytes. Dermatomycosis is a more general term, and this is applied for any skin disease caused by a fungus. So, dermatomycosis and dermatophytosis are two different things. Uh, today, we'll talk about dermatophytosis. Or, in other words, it's about cutaneous mycosis. So, cutaneous mycosis are fungal infections of uh, keratinized layers of the skin, like the epidermis, hair, and nail are involved. And uh, it's also called ringworm disease or tenia. Why do you think the fungal infections? We're, we're talking about tenia, 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 or ringworm. Why do you think they are called just, la just like this, right? Why they are called tenia? or ringworm. Any other? Yeah, people are uh, leaving them. <laughs> it doesn't matter, but <laughs> the consequence, you know. 
stick comment me arg why do you think that this is a fungal infection but we are saying like tinea or uh, ingworm infection why do you think they are called so why they are called tinea or why, why they are called ringworm uh, disease anybody who can we can share his or her idea Brooke, thank you very much. It's really brilliant. So yeah, it's uh, because of the the appearance of the, the lesions. Uh, Brooke said it. So when you see the lesions, I will show you later. They like uh, circular and ring like. So that that's why, and they actually like look like a circular worm, and that's why they are called. Ringworm or Tinea. You know, Tinea is a parasite, you know? We have Tinea solium, Tinea, um, what you call this? Uh, <laughs> the common one. We have Tinea, so Tinea is for worms or for uh, little, little, no? Again, uh, since uh, this, uh, this, the lesion looks like, like, like a circular worm, is they are called ringworm disease or tenia. Tenia signita, I mean, yeah. So the main etiology agents for uh, cutaneous mycosis are dermatophytes. They are also called skin plants. And this group of fungi, they are keratinophilic and keratinolytic. You know, they can digest keratin by their keratinases because they love it. They are keratinophilic and they are resistant to cyclohexamide that's another property of dermatophytes and morphologically they are almost similar and they do have safety hyphae and chance of arthrochronidia so hyphae can be classified into two that's the molds you know it could be like safety or aseptic most fungi they do have safety hyphae that means there is there are there are Cross walls, cross walls across the the, the filament. Bemhal bemhal cross kallo safety the balance. Most to come to you on a long elongated body corner demo a safety type the balance malatim. So most of the fungal pathogens actually they do have a safety type the mold assignment. And I told you about that through conidia. So the dermatophytes they can be classified into three genera depend uh, including the microsporum trichophyton and epidermophyton uh, groups so each of them are they are associated with a different disease actually you know uh, for example the microsporum uh, they basically um, affect hair and skin and uh, rarely nails but uh, in case of the trichophyton they can affect hair, skin, and nails equally. Epidermophyton, they mm, affect skin, nails, and really hair, and they have different uh, preferences for the, the hostess. For example, in case of the, the microsporum, uh, they affect children, mainly, and then really adults. In this case, this reverse, the epidermophyton, they affect adults and really children. We can read it. So, and that the, this genera, there are lots of species, but the common species includes like for ep epidermophyton, we have ep epidermophyton flocosum, and from um, for the microsporum, we have uh, microsporum canis, microsporum uh, gypsum, and they like, and for the trichophyton, trichophyton, we have like trichophyton rubrum, uh, trichophyton mentagrophytes, uh, trichophyton, vericosum, uh, bolashin, and the like. So there are actually lots of species for each group, but these are the examples. And uh, they do have like the, the sort of structure which can be classified as macroconidia and microconidia. So conidia is for macro means large and micro small, you know it. So for example, for trichophyton, uh, the macroconidia are rare but uh, the microconidia are abundant so whenever you observe under the microscope from the space taking a specimen then you expect like uh, 
many microconidia if you are looking for trichophyton and the microsporum uh, the microconidia the numerous so the the, the microconidia rare and the permaphyton uh, uh, the microconidia are absent in this case so these things can be can be used to differentiate the, the, the this genera this for example uh, uh, the uh, macroconidia of uh, microsporum uh, canis, and uh, this is uh, the macroconidia of the ipromite and locus, just like this. So this is this is uh, whenever it is viewed under a microscope. And as you know, I know. So when this is the ecology and the epidemiology, uh, dermatophytes they can be classified into three ecological groups. We have anthropophilic geophilic and zoophilic species so as their name implies you know anthropo anthropophilic means they, they uh, love humans so they are associated with uh, humans uh, like the, these groups uh, the geophilic species uh, they are uh, residing in soil and so the infection will be from the soil from the environment and the zoophilic species they are associated with animals and here the most important thing is you know the severity of the infection of the disease depends on the strains or species of the fungus involved you know and uh, let's say if the anthropy the anthropophilic species cross to animals will be more severe and uh, if the zoophilic species you know if they infect humans the infection uh, could be uh, more severe because the, the that those are not natural hosts so the, the, the severity um, increases whenever the species cross the host, uh, the host uh, categories. So that's an important point here. And the major source of ringworm infection, you know, are this, these things, warm, damp area, and the like schools, these things uh, are uh, predisposing factors. I mean, source of, source of infection, sorry. Sources of infection. Kazi, let me again, Chilalan. Let me What is happening here, guys? Hello? Can you hear me? Can you see it? I can't see my slide. <laughs> I don't know what happened. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Let me let me share it again. It is soft and so I think I should share it, share it again. Wait, just a moment. Open and now shut. Yeah. So So we are here, so yeah, uh, they can uh, be associated with different uh, groups and, uh, you know, the source of infection varies accordingly. The disease, uh, so in the hairy areas, uh, they could cause like tenia calpitis, tenia barbe in the, on the skin, tenia corporis, tenia cururis, tenia manum and the likes and, and on the nail that is turning in game. Uh, so let's talk about in you know, it as an infection of uh, the scalp hair, but it can also affect the eyebrows and eyelashes. And uh, the fungus grows into the hair follicle, 
and you'll see such a, such a manifestation. The common etiologists include the trichophyton species like trichophyton mintagrophytes, and uh, we have also microsporum uh, canis. So these are uh, like uh, uh, showing the manifestation of TNA capitis. capitis. TNA barbie uh, is a uh, ringworm fish and has a beard, and such manifestation can happen. The hair infections uh, caused by dermatophytes, they can be classified into, on, um, into different groups based on the invasion pattern. They can be called that ectotrix whenever, whenever the arthrospores uh, are on the surface of the hair, just like this. And these uh, groups cause uh, ectotrix uh, uh, pattern, and uh, the other groups are endotrix, and in this case, uh, the arthrospores they grow inside the hair shaft only, and they they create a black dot just like this. And we have a lot of favors, uh, favors here, and it's just like this. So let's let's see the clinical manifestations of the ringworm of uh, the body. Yeah, we, talk, we already discussed about the uh, TNA capitis. Now let's talk about TNA corporis. So, as you can see, this uh, ring worm of the body, and you will see uh, such a structure. You, can you see the, this, uh, the ring structure? As you can see here, yeah, you have such a structure. And uh, this uh, resembles a ring worm. And it's, uh, it's happening in the body. When it happens on the body, it's called TNA. Kenya corporis. So like different uh, figures showing Kenya corporis. The other groups are Kenya corporis, and uh, they happen in, in on the gory, gory area, gory area, and uh, you see such manifestations. You know, they often start on scrotum and spread to the uh, groin uh, as dry lesions, just like this. They are also called jokic. Why do you think they are called jokic? You can read or uh, you can chat later. The common theology include, we have like trichophytum, mantogrophytes, and the likes. It also here, if you don't, if you don't, if you don't So, Kenya pedis, uh, these are uh, uh, dermatophytes, uh, dermatophytosis affecting uh, the foot. It's also called athletic foot infection, and it usually happens between the two, so two webs, and uh, it could be like itching of any part of the foot and the legs. And the transmission and everything you can read. The common theologists, like we have trichophyton or abram, Minta, Grophytes, and Iflocosum, just like the previous one, the Cruis. This is an image showing athletes for motivation for Kenya Apiedis. So as you can see, you see such manifestations. Mm 
So can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, okay, thank you. Bro. So let's try it this way and then uh, uh, in game uh, as an infection of the nails, it's also called oncomycosis. And uh, the common etiologies include like trichophyton, um, trichophyton, mintagrophytes, and ipromo um, flocosal. And uh, unlike the other, the previous one, the uh, TNA angium or oncomycosis is really resistant to treatment. Rarely resolved spontaneously. For example, TNA porporis, it can resolve, resolve spontaneously the body infection. But in this case, it rarely resolves spontaneously and uh, it's resistant to treatment. The treatment should be given like uh, for a long period of time. Yeah, these are uh, pictures. So the laboratory diagnosis, uh, nausea symptoms, wound lamp examination in general, you know. Wood slump uh, examination, when, yeah, so it's to visualize the lesions. Wood slump examination, as a clinical examination, and then the sample should be taken, skin, nail scrappings, and, uh, and uh, from hair, or plucked hair, and should be taken. And whenever we take the samples, it's, it's, uh, the age, the age, I mean, the age is really important, you know? As you can see from the previous picture on the corporis, you know, the, the edge is a, a bit necrotized. So the probability of uh, getting the fungus or the etiology will be higher as the edges of the ring worm. The middle is already like, you know, the skin is already um, destroyed and, uh, you know, it's, it's almost flat, but whenever we you move to the edges, then uh, the probability of getting the fungus or isolation of the etiologic agent will increase. So when you take the when we take the scrapping, this skin or nail scrapping, whatever, uh, the edges are better to consider. So then, di direct microscopy examination can be uh, can be done after. Uh, 10% uh, coach preparation actually. Uh, that is here is really important to use 10% uh, coach because you know we are taking samples from nail, from hair, and from skin which are rich in uh, keratin material. So that should be digested uh, uh, so that the fungus can be uh, easily visualized. So you will see like safety type branching high line. Safety type high line means not colored. Previously, we talked about dematicious fungi. Those, those do have uh, a colored hyphae, but in this case, high line is, uh, is like colorless hyphae. So it's a safety hyphae. The culture can be used on several different agar with and without antibiotics, depending on the species. There is also a so called Dermatophyte test medium specific for dermatophytes, and this can be also used. And also, like the other tests, there are hair proportion tests, race tests, and the likes. So, yeah. And treatment uh, for mild cases, topical imidazole groups can be used, but like, you know, imidazoles. And whenever the, the infection is severe, then oral uh, antifungal agents should be uh, should be considered. And for the skin, like the treatment should be four to six weeks for the hair, three to six months, and for the nails should be like for at least a year. So it's a long period for the nails. So any questions so far? We have already done with the, the superficial and the cutaneous mycosis. Any questions so far or? Uh, Let's see. Let's see. Please, any questions or reflections? 
it's really difficult <laughs> to interact on the online system. Can I ask, uh, let's see, I see here like Anania. Oh, she is lefty. <laughs> what was uh, like? I don't. I don't say uh, leave the meeting. I, I'm asking question. Shall we take a break? You know, to continue with the opportunity mycosis. Like five to five minutes break. Yeah, but uh, you know, you have to come back. Yeah, who was thinking? Uh, a broke asked like want uh, using the KOH for uh, the carotene surface of fungal species structure or properties. Uh, a good question. But it doesn't actually affect because you know a fungus is a the fungal cell is a, is a really complex compared to the this uh, the human cell and normally it's not the cell actually affected it's only the keratin material that that has been removed so for the fungus uh, you know the basic structure will not be affected. But it's okay if uh, the unnecessary uh, structures, you know, which are not common, which are not important in the diagnosis, should be like also, also digested and washed away uh, due to coverage. So it doesn't actually uh, damage the fungus basic structure or the, the elements that we, we look for the diagnosis, I would say. So if you don't have any questions, then uh, I'll be back after, uh, let's say like after five minutes. Atidu, let's say, the Quintas Faragallo. Five minutes break now. It's like, uh, at 10, uh, we'll start the second session. Arasal in general, Martin.
Okay. Back. Not a chalo who. I wasn't actually talking, okay? Mute are given. So then let's uh, get started. Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you guys. So let's get started with the next session. So the next session is about uh, opportunistic uh, microsystems. So as we already defined it, uh, this group of uh, mycosis, the, their virulence is uh, lower compared to the endemic or the, this, uh, the normal uh, fungi causing disease in, in uh, normal individuals. So these infections, th these uh, fungal pathogens, uh, they actually cause uh, disease only in immunocompromised people, basically they cause this is in immunocompromised people. But nowadays, you know, they are getting really important and their, uh, their uh, uh, clinical importance is uh, increasing from time to time. What do you think is the reason that, you know, the opportunistic mycosis and uh, uh, in particular and the fungal infections in general, they are getting attention and uh, their uh, the clinical uh, significance is increasing uh, from time to time. Why do you think is the reason for that? Anybody who can share us something about this? Why do you think is the reason that? You know, previously it was like bacterial infections. You know, we have still bacterial infections, but you know, now with those uh, fungal diseases are also getting attention and their prevalence is increasing, uh, and the clinical significance is really increasing from time to time. What do you think are the, you know, the reasons for this? Anybody who can share us something about this? Please, anybody who be appreciated. Share any ideas can be shared, you know? It's just uh, brainstorming. No. So the reason is because you know the host, their host is increasing. How? It's because of the increasing burden of chronic disease. Now you know if you see in Ethiopia, for example, chronic disease are increasing, diabetes is increasing, and uh, the cancer is increasing, and we have also HIV there. Uh, all of them which lead to immunocompromisation and, and uh, make the host susceptible to such a, such a uh, fungal pathogen. So because of the increased immunocompromised population, because of the increment of the, the hosts, uh, this, these uh, uh, fungal uh, pathogens, which were actually friendly previously, they are now becoming, uh, you know, uh, becoming, uh, virulent and causing infection in the in the immunocompromised in people. <coughs> Sorry, I, I get blocked. Yeah, so that's the main reason. It's because of the increasing population of immunocompromised hosts because of the, the disease, you know, the chronic disease. And when you see the, the uh, number of uh, fungal pathogens across different uh, groups, you know, for systemic pathogens, there are approximately you know, 25 species. And for, for cutaneous, like 33 species, and for subcutaneous, we have like 10 species, so you can uh, sum all of them. And, you know, 
like uh, less than 100 for the normal host. But when we see the, the immunocompromised host, you know, there are more than uh, 300 species associated with the infection with this uh, group of uh, uh, people or hosts. So you can, you can appreciate how they are really getting, you know, important uh, nowadays. The common opportunistic fungal uh, diseases include like candiasis, aspergillosis, uh, cryptococcosis, and nemocystosis. These are uh, the common opportunistic fungal uh, disease or fungal infections, but it doesn't mean that they are all. There are many other opportunistic fungal infections, but these are uh, really the most important ones, especially this, the, the first three they are really important, where candiasis, aspergillosis, and cryptococcus are really uh, important. So let's, let's, start the, let's get started with the candidiasis. So candidiasis as an fungal infection is caused by candidia species. So candidia, they are yeast like uh, fungi. So we talked uh, previously. Normally, they are yeast like fungi, forming pseudohyphae just like this. But whenever they infect an individual, they can form uh, hyphae, true hyphae, in the tissue. And this is an important uh, virulence mechanism for them. Yeah. <laughs> No, for example, yes, I'm Hello, hello, sorry. Are you there? Are we there? Yeah, okay. So, uh, so this uh, candidiasis is caused by the candidia species, and the candidia are yeast like fungi. Morphologically, normally they are yeast like fungi, but after infection, they can form through hyphae uh, in the tissue. So, yeast like means they, they, do, they form actually the pseudo hyphae. And there are more than uh, 150 species of candida, but uh, actually about 10 cause disease in humans. So the most important ones include uh, Candida albicans, Candida tropic tropicalis, Candida glabrata, and Candida cruci. So, you know, this Candida albicans is uh, the most important one, I would say, out of this. The other groups, they are called non-albicans candidia. So there is a grouping, candidia albicans and non-albicans candidia. This is because most of the infections are caused by candidia albicans. But still, there are non-candidia albicans like candidia tropicalis, candidia glabrata, and candidia cursi, they are also important. And the candidiasis is a, the, the leading fungal infection among the immunocompromised population like diabetic patients, HIV infected patients, and, and cancer patients. When you say epidemiology, uh, you know, the infection, the source of infection could be endogenous. Candidia albicans, for example, is, is normal flora of uh, the different body parts. It's, part, it's a common cell of the skin. You can get it in the gastrointestinal tract, the genitourinary tract, and the respiratory tract. So from there, it could be an infection whenever the, the host homosteasis is disturbed, there could be an infection. But the infection, the infection could be also exogenous because we can get 
Candidia species, Candidia albicans, in the hospital environment, like air conditioner, vent floors, and the like. So, both exogenous and endogenous uh, roads can, can be the way for the transmission or the source of infections. And uh, the risk factors, there are different risk factors. So, in general, immunocompromisation is uh, the risk factor, but, and it can happen due to different diseases. For example, diabetes, HIV. Uh, also, if there is a procedure, uh, post-operative immune suppression that could happen. Mm, use of corticosteroids, you know, they could be immunosuppressant, as you, as you might know. And also, uh, use of urinary catheter can predispose. In this case, you know, it could be like inserted through the urinary catheter. So these are some of the risk factors, so the predisposing factors for hand infection. So when you see the pathogenesis first, we said uh, it does have yeast stage and it forms the pseudo the pseudo hyphae. So the yeast stage is, uh, is uh, by itself is uh, an important virulence factor because it's kind of for a biofilm. Biofilm. What does biofilm mean? Anybody? Biofilm. Biofilm. Brookum Tafam Salam. If we don't have Brooks and anybody, Biofilm Malam Malatum. Thank you, the Tolera. Okay, well, thank you. You know, it's well appreciated in bacteria, you know, and in dental disease, in dental caries. This is uh, like formed by the accumulation of bacteria. One bacteria, uh, like, you know, sticks with the other bacteria and this uh, collation is called biofilm and that will be resistant for treatment, you know. Um, so bacteria and the dental care is really difficult uh, to remove, uh, even by using like, by brushing and, and also it would be difficult to treat because the, it would be difficult for the drugs to penetrate that biofilm and then reach each bacteria uh, in the biofilm. So yeast is, is, is uh, like oval or circular thing and uh, uh, those can collect together and form biofilm and that would be a, a virulence factor for candy albicans that can help for the, the spreading. Because, you know, our immune system we, uh, will not be able to uh, conquer the biofilm easily and that way can the we can, can spread. That's one virulence factor. The other virulence factor and the most important one actually is the ability to change to a high file form. It's called also phenotypic switching, you know. So once the host is infected, the yeast will enter and the yeast like that the pseudohype could enter to the body, but after entering the, into the tissue, it will be converted to a true hyphae. So, you know, there are molecular mechanisms very advanced. We will not talk about them here. But whenever there is a change, that's really important for candial beacons because uh, that form, the hyphal form, has different. Uh, different uh, mechanisms uh, to affect the uh, human epithelial cells. For example, it can attach, it can strongly attach to the epithelial cells and also the true hyphae secretes, it secretes uh, uh, different enzymes like proteins, proteins uh, like proteinases and phospholipases which can degrade uh, the human tissue. So that way, uh, the candy albicans will get advantage to spread into the host uh, tissue and then establish the infection. There are other, other different other uh, uh, virulence factors, like it may also produce like the toxins, but they are not covered here. But the most important one is the biofilm formation due to the yeast and then the transition from uh, the yeast to the high file form uh, uh, will uh, trigger the infection in the hosts. 
So let's see the clinical disease. It can cause different diseases. Any organ can be affected by the way, by candida albicans. But the most important one, the most common one is uh, oropharyngeal candidiasis. It's also called trash, trash, oral trash, just like this. And it's common in, immuno in immunocompromised people. Most importantly, it's common in HIV patients. So you will see such a, such a manifestation. Candidia albicans uh, can also cause the respiratory tract infections. It's called respiratory tract candidiasis. And it can happen like as laryngeal candidiasis or as tracheobronchitis. So these are more of clinical. You will deal with in the future. But the, yeah, I have to mention that it causes a different uh, infections in the respiratory tract as well. Uh, there is also so-called Volvo, uh, Volvo vaginal candidiasis, VVC. And you know, it's normal flora of the genital urinary, urinary tract and the, gen the genital tract, I mean, especially in uh, women, you can find it in the, in the genital tract area. So that's normal, but when the physiology changes, it can cause uh, infection. So like, 75% of women uh, may, may experience at least one episode of a uh, vaginal candidiasis. And the recurrence is also common. Uh, another important uh, patient due to candidia species, and most importantly due to candidia albicans, is the uh, urinary tract candidiasis. And uh, uh, as common in patients, having a uh, catheter, urinary catheter. Do you know catheter? So, yeah. Yeah, well, in parallel, it's limited to white actually on each level. You know, that device. So that will uh, predispose the patient to get a fungal infection. And it's urinary tract candias is common on those uh, patients. Another important uh, risk factor for urinary tract candidiasis is having diabetes mellitus. It, it may predispose patients to, to candida urea. Uh, so there will, there will be glycosuria. There will be glycosuria and that will be uh, a good environment for the fungus to grow. To grow. Glycosuria malam malat no? Glycosuria. Anybody? Yeah, Fikr, yeah, you answered it, you know, previously. Uh, this uh, biofilm, thank you. So, what does glycosuria mean? Exactly, Jerusalem, thank you. Glucose in the urine, yeah. In abnormal amount, of course. Yeah, that's a. Uh, that's, uh, Thank you. So whenever uh, there is a glycosuria, you know, whenever there is high amount of glucose, the urinary uh, tract, then it supports the growth of, you know, the fungus uses that and it can grow and then it can cause infection. So there will be overgrowth of the fungal pathogen. This is the candida albicans and it can cause urinary tract candidiasis, so that the diabetes mellitus is really an important predisposing factor. Um, another uh, predisposing factor for urinary candidiasis is uh, like, um, yeah, we have immuno, use of immunosuppressive agents and the like antibiotics, they can increase uh, candidiasis in general. Especially in the GI tract, and there is also as there could be an ascending infection. So, what does an ascending infection means? You know, let's talk about it. You know, it can happen in bacteria, it can happen in fungus. So, what's an ascending infection of the urinary tract? Ascending infection. Anybody? Anybody who can reflect will be appreciated. Let's see, Minagran Mal. 
the infection could happen due to the ascending of the pathogen. What does it mean? And cause urinary tract infection. So ascending infection is common in candidia uh, urinary tract infection. How it happens and anybody who can tell us something. No, I think you know it. So, so normally we said uh, Candida albicans is a normal product of the genito uh, urinary tract, particularly in the genital area, the vagina, and the like. So from there, you know, it could ascend to to the upward to the um, urinary uh, organs, you know. So by ascending, it can reach to the sterile body sites and cause infection. Ureter, ureter and uh, then bladder could be infected and then you have kidneys causing pyelonephritis. That's well appreciated in bacterial infection. You know, Shershia coli, E. coli causes uh, uh, is a mo causes a urinary tract infection, and this is really the most important because that your UTI, UTI, and uh, that happens due to ascending infection. But it can also happen for fungus like Candida albicans, as it is normal throughout the uh, genital tract. And the ascending infection is common in females compared to uh, males, uh, basically due to the difference in the in the anatomy. You know, you know that. So. The females have the urethra is shorter and wider, but for males it's uh, longer. So ascending will be easier for for females and cause the uh, urinary tract infection and also the proximity of the uh, the, the anus and the vagina and uh, also predisposes uh, females. So that's why uh, these ascending infections, uh, ascending urinary tract infections, of course, are common in females compared to males. So the another, uh, that's another scenario in uh, uh, Candida albicans. The, there could be also a sort of hematogenous spread. So in this case, you know, once the Candida albicans enters into the blood, it can spread to different organs through the blood circulation. And then it can uh, cause renal candidates, for example. It can affect the, the, you know, there is ascending, but in addition, by by uh, traveling through the blood circulation, it can it can reach to the kidney and then cause uh, the, the pyelonephritis or other other patients. But it doesn't mean if you get the candida in the urine, it doesn't mean it doesn't necessarily mean that that's an infection. It's normal flora could be contamination or. But it could be like a sort of colonization from the drainage device means from the environment. But on the other hand, it could be infection. So, you know, you have to associate with the clinical, uh, clinical findings whenever you suspect uh, these uh, urinary tract infections for candida. So candida urea is, uh, is often asymptomatic. It doesn't uh, necessarily reflect infection. Another form of uh, infection by candial becomes is abdominal candidiasis, and uh, uh, it could have it could have been due to spontaneous uh, uh, perforation of the GI tract or after surgery. Uh, this can develop. There are different risk factors you can receive straightforward. The other thing is a chronic mucocutaneous candidiasis CM CMC. Uh, this is a severe most often widespread uh, erythematous or granulomatous infection of the mucous membranes, the skins, and nails in patients with conjunctural um, immunological or endocrinological disorders. So this is uh, rare, but it can happen in such, in such individuals, chronic mucoctanase candidiasis. The other infections can happen. There could be candida osteomyelitis and arthritis, candidemia and disseminated candidiasis can happen, 
So a range of infection can be caused by candial beacons, and it's really the most important fungal, fungal, fungal pathogen, the leading cause of fungal days, fungal uh, related days is caused by candial beacons. What does osteo, osteomyelitis mean? Osteomyelitis. Anybody are you there or uh, osteomyelitis? Osteomyelitis of yeah, Lydia, I think it's a bone infection, swelling is a bone, exactly broke thinky. Yeah, so it can also cause osteomyelitis. But the most important cause is in are bacteria like staphylococcus aureus. The laboratory diagnosis. Uh, we have to take the appropriate specimen like scrapping swabs, blood can be used in disseminated infections. Uh, depend so different specimens can be taken depending on the site of infection and um, weight mount and the microscopy. In this case, uh, weight mount means just you drop the specimen on the slide and then you see under the microscope. So the yeasts can be seen that way. Uh, but uh, that means they are uh, sufficient. So. The germ tube test is here uh, important for identification of the species. So the different species uh, respond uh, to treatment for uh, differently. And for that purpose, uh, there could be species identification. For example, Candidia albicans and Candidia dublinensis, uh, both of them, they are germ test, uh, uh, germ tube test positive. Or other candidates, they are germ test, uh, germ tube test negative. So most importantly, uh, germ tube test is done for to differentiate candidia albicans from the other groups of candidia called non-candidia albicans. So there is a procedure: uh, 0.5 ml of serum. Uh, containing 0.5% uh, percent glucose together, they will be incubated with a, with a specimen, you know. In the tube, you have this 0.5 ml of serum and you have 0.5% of glucose in a tube. We add the sample in that tube and then we see uh, we see the reaction. So on microscopy, uh, the production of germ tubes by the cells is a uh, diagnostic for candida albicans. So you mean, you know, candida albicans is a, a, a yeast-like fungus, so it forms what? Pseudohyphae. So if the specimen contains uh, um, candida albicans, you know, there is serum, there is glucose, and then the candida albicans tries to germinate, and while germinating, it forms the pseudohyphae. And that pseudohyphae looks like a tube, tube, and that is called germ tube. So if pseudohyphae is formed, and then that indicates candida albicans, and probably also candida dubliensis. But the other groups, they are germ. Uh, tube test uh, negative. So that's a procedure and it's important for species identification because species identification is, uh, is, uh, is clinically important for treatment. It can be also cultured. Several dextrose agar with antibiotics can be used and uh, can be or actually grow on uh, bacteriological media with antibiotics. But this CDA is really important. So, yeah, the, the treatment. Here, the choice of antifungal agent uh, is based on the consideration of relative drug toxicity. Yeah, in general, you know this. Uh, this it's not only for uh, the fungus, but it works for other other vicious diseases. A range of uh, antifungal agents can be used, like amphotericin B, the ketoconazole groups, the uh, minimidazole, and uh, the pollens like uh, amphotericin B can be used. So it depends, you know. Depends on the, the guidelines on the so every time it should be revised actually because uh, re development of resistance to azil azol antifungus is common we have to be careful when we treat uh, this uh, candida 
and becomes efficient. Any questions? Yeah, can not? Indeed, yeah, what the Tunish Kara or Ranmanam, name you the Kamin, you know. Any questions? No question. So let's talk about aspergillosis. Uh, this is a, the second most commonly recovered fungus, an uh, no opportunistic mycosis, hollow candia. So this is the second most important uh, um, disease, fungal disease associated with the opportunistic uh, fungal pathogens. So aspergillosis is. Uh, uh, is caused by the aspergillus species, and uh, there are more than 100 species of aspergillus. It's not, it's, uh, and uh, the medically important species include uh, uh, so it's aspergillus, sorry. Aspergillus is the disease, and aspergillus at the species. So, there are actually more than 100 species of aspergillus, but the most important ones, medically important species causing disease in humans, includes aspergillus fumigatus, aspergillus nigger, and aspergillus flavus. These are the most important ones. Fumigatus, nigger, and flavus are the most important ones. And when this is epidemiology, uh, so the main source of infection is the environment. And most importantly, it's associated with grains, grain processing uh, areas. So they could be harboring this aspergillus species. So that's the most important source of infection. And the uh, transmission is by inhalation of the spores from, from the source. And the uh, pathogenesis uh, uh, is a, uh, now, it produces different uh, uh, enzymes like proteases and elastases, which can degrade the uh, tissue and facilitate the spreading of the aspergillus species. It can also grow at 37 degrees centigrade and then, you know, be like changing, that will, that will uh, enable uh, its survival in the human body. Uh, and uh, it's commonly associated with neutropenic and bone marrow transplant uh, patients, we'll see later. So let's talk here, uh, you know, uh, neutropenic patients are normally, they are at, at higher risk of getting opportunistic fungal infections, not only aspergillosis, they, they are also at risk of getting candiasis and, and, and the likes. And it's because, you know, neutrophils are really important fighters against uh, fungal uh, infections. So neutrop neutropenic patients are patients with a lower number of neutrophils, and that will predispose them for, a, for an infection to common in neutrophil patients. The spectrum of the disease can be invasive, like inflammatory, granulomatous, and the likes. Uh, it can occur as an allergy. Allergy. There is also a so-called mycotoxicosis. It can cause intoxication of the foods, and uh, it could be like transient, transient uh, colonization, simply or it can even cause systemic infection. So the spectrum of disease takes a range of, a range of uh, types. The clinical form then, there is so-called allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, aspergilloma, fungus pole. This is whenever the, you know, the fungus blocks, blocks your, uh, your uh, respiratory tract, aspergilloma ipalal malatno. But it can cause invasive pulmonary aspergillosis. This is the most severe one. Invasive pulmonary aspergillosis can be caused by the aspergillus species. And there could be disseminated uh, uh, aspergillosis, you know, through the blood, it can lead to the, the heart and can increase the heart causing endocardiates and uh, can lead to the brain and cause cerebral aspergillosis. Uh, so it's, 
in um, so when you say the laboratory diagnosis uh, we have to take appropriate specimen again for example uh, the bronco alveolar lavage ball is, is a really one of the most important uh, specimens considered for the diagnosis as porculosis mm, and uh, uh, tissue any tissue in fact the tissue can be taken sinus drainage so depending on the size of infection we have to take the appropriate specimen and then here we have to treat it with 10 percent potassium hydroxide as usual and we see like highland septic type it does have a safety type but here detection of the hyphae in clinical material and the repeated detection by culture is critical for diagnosis this is really important if you get like if you get a report from the laboratory like by a simple microscopy examination and that doesn't necessarily mean that there is an infection there could be contamination because it's prevalent environment so repeated uh, testing is really important and if there is a, a facility and culture could be done and uh, histopathological examination also should be should be done in order to uh, uh, provide the definite diagnosis and yeah you have to use your clinical decision as well i forgot one important thing here you know the aflatoxin uh, it causes cancer in, so it's carcinogenic and it can cause uh, liver cancer by the way liver cancer and this produced by aspergillus flowers so back to the diagnosis <laughs> Culture is uh, so really important if the facility is available, as there are frequent contamination from the environment, you know, the presence of a, this uh, aspergillus species doesn't necessarily mean there's an infection, so culture should be done, and histopathological examinations should be also done as much possible. So here is a procedure for the culture. It can grow on, on a routine mycologic media like Sabra dextrose agar, but we have we have, we don't have to use the cyclohexamide. We don't we don't have to add this one because uh, it's, it's a medical fungus. So positive culture again might be a sign of transit exposure or infection. So even positive culture could be due to contamination or like it could be like due to uh, transient exposure, just exposure. So we have to add like other procedures, clinical decision and the likes. That's the month, it depends on the type of mission again. Uh, so early initiation of therapy is really important for invasive pulmonary aspergillosis because we said it's really very serious. This is serious and it's common actually, you know, in immunocompromised population, especially uh, here in Black Lion, it's uh, being re-innovated re as you might have seen it. So there is a report that uh, this, uh, such infections are increasing, you know. The aspergillosis infections uh, uh, are increasing in this hospital environment because of this uh, the environmental degradation. Yeah, so the Zia is, is um, a really important infection. And uh, the treatment surgery might be considered its size for aspergilloma, for example. It's blockage, so you have to remove that and the likes. It's more clinical. The other one is uh, cryptococcus, and this is caused by cryptococcus species. Either cryptococcus neoformans or cryptococci. Again, there are over 50 species, but the most important ones are the Cryptococcus neoformans and uh, Cryptococcus uh, gati, and they are associated with a uh, with, uh, different environment. So the source of infection is like for Cryptococcus neoformans is the environment and the edged bird, bird sorry, edged bird droppings. It, it's uh, it's uh, found in the bird's uh, droppings or feces and it occurs globally and most importantly affects the immunocompromised individuals again. 
Cryptococcus gadi is also associated with environment, but it is associated with the eucalyptus tree. The bar zaf zaf lay no associated with no, because an infection we can use malat no. And it, the difference between Cryptococcus newformans and Cryptococcus gadi in terms of causing infection is that Cryptococcus gadi can cause infection in immunocompetent individuals. That one is associated with immunocompromised, but the GATI can cause uh, infection in normal individuals. And the uh, transmission is by inhalation of the spore or uh, yeast. This is the life cycle. As you can see here, the spores will be inhaled and they, then uh, to, they will reach to the uh, lung. And then uh, from the lung, there will be dissemination to the central nervous system and causes uh, meningitis. The clinical diseases in, uh, include like pulmonary infection and uh, uh, CNS infection. There could be skin infection uh, and others, but the pulmonary and CNS infections are the most important clinical disease caused by this cryptococcus uh, 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 species, especially cryptococcus neoformans. So let's talk about pulmonary infection. Uh, so the portal of entry is a uh, you know, the, the nose, the, the yeast will be inhaled, and it's actually the most important uh, portal of entry to cause uh, an infection. After the pulmonary infection, there will be dissemination to the, the central nervous system, and the CNS infection follows. So that's why it's called the most important portal of entry for portal of entry for infection. Uh, yeah, you can see the different manifestations with present with clinical syndromes of subacute meningitis or remaining encephalitis. You know, this, yeah, of course, it's meningitis and encephalitis. So, and in HIV patients, uh, it causes complications like iris, uh, it's advanced, and there could be also cryptococoma, uh, it's a real entity caused by localized solid tumor like mass usually found in the cerebral hemisphere of the cerebrum. So you can read these things, but basically I will, I will say that these cryptococcus informants or cryptococcus species in general, they enter through the, by the nose, reach to the lungs, and then they spread to the central nervous system and cause meningitis and meningoencephalitis, and that's the most important manifestation. Even though they first reach to the, uh, the lung, the CNS infection is the most common and severe form of infection caused by cryptococcus uh, neoformans. So they are known for causing meningitis, fungal meningitis. The laboratory diagnosis, we have to take appropriate specimens like sputum, uh, blood, uh, cerebrospinal fluid, uh, I'm sorry, I don't know what happened. And the likes. Indian ink uh, uh, preparation can be used, by the way. So after staining using Indian ink, you will see cryptococcus neoformans, fluorescence, fluorescing again as a background. You know, background, you know, you know, encapsular disease, you know, I hope uh, in the laboratory they will show you. NASA Yachwalanin. Culture can be done. And it can be done on uh, several drugs to Zagar. And there is an important, uh, now, you know, rapid test. Cryptocal antigen, let me ball with this to Chalu. And as he, they are really important. They are rapid and they can detect the antigen from the blood and they can support treatment. They are sensitive and specific and they have been used widely in the hospital environment. I don't know whether they are applying it in the the it would be most that black lion or not, but uh, it really is really important because it can uh, detect the antigens. The Indian in, in staining it takes time, it's sensitivity matters, and the culture is difficult. But the cryptocal antigens are just kits, just like HIV testing. They are kits and they can uh, detect the antigens if the individual is infected. So the source of infection is uh, from the environment. It's normal, but it's not normal flora. So probably, uh, you know, if it enters, it causes infection and antigen detection is sensitive. Antibody detection, you cannot really own that because it's, it could be fast infection. But if it's, if 
it is antigen detection then that's really helpful for to support the treatment a lot a lot am i just debarking <laughs> Johanna can you let you mala? Johanna? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I see. Uh, okay, I see. So thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah, let's talk about the treatment. So yeah, a range of antifungal agents can be used, but unfortunately is really the most important uh, antifungal agent. Tamaru and Ungidisla and Pharmacology lay them to let Richla is very important. Even so, its penetration to the, to the brain is a bit minimal, but there are, there, there are formulations for, uh, to decrease actually the toxicity. There are formulations, but it's actually the most important antifungal agent for critical meningitis. And so far, there is a, a very low. Uh, Drug resistance development against amphotericin B. Uh, also, you can you can read this one. Prevention of specific effects are known to cause fungal meningitis. So it's avoiding the risk factor system best for the prevention. The last one is a uh, uh, pneumocystosis. So pneumocystosis is caused by the fungus. This is Jerovesai. They, they pronounce it as Jerovesai. And formerly it was called uh, Pneumocystis carnai. But uh, later it was found that, you know, uh, the Pneumocystis Jerovesai is associated with human invasions. So previously it was believed that there was only one species, and that was. Uh, pneumocystis carnai, but later the, it was found that the, there are more than one species and the different species are associated with different uh, diseases in humans and animals. So uh, nowadays it's a uh, pneumocystis carnai, it's associated with, with animal disease. So the one causing uh, pneumocystis, uh, pneumocystis in humans is pneumocystis gerovesi. So uh, actually, uh, it was first identified in the early 1990s, and, uh, and it was considered as a parasite. You know Chagas disease? Have you learned about uh, uh, Chagas disease or tri triponosomiasis? Tamrachul, have you? Hmm? Yeah. So you you know about Chagas disease, you know? It's not common in Africa, like it's common. So that's caused by uh, um, Triponosoma yasi, Triponosoma cruzi. So it was, uh, so it was sort of like, it's, it was a parasite in that group. But uh, later, uh, after characterization, um, it was found that it's uh, rather close to fungi. Uh, rather than the parasites for protozoa and parasites. So now it's, it's, grouped, it's, it's grouped under the fungal pathogens. So is pneumocystis a fungus? Yes, definitely now it's grouped uh, under fung fungal pathogens. Basically, it's, uh, the cell lacks rigidity. But the fungal cell wall is rigid, does have chitin and the like, so it's, it's rigid. But on the other hand, uh, it does have the biochemical elements of, of the fungal cell wall. Like that's a glucan, which has a major subunit of chitin. You know, the fungal cell is made up of chitin, outer layer. So those things are there. And when you see the cytoplasm, uh, it's more of cholesterol, you know. Cholesterol is uh, for uh, animal cells, but for fungal, it's ergosterol. Even though it's like the cell is made up of mainly cholesterol, just uh, just like animal cells, and it could be like protozoa. But 
the other characteristics, uh, uh, you know, outnumber, outnumber and they predominate. So the fungal characteristics uh, predominate still. And whenever the molecular characterization was done, you know, the sequencing and the like, uh, more specific characterization was done and later it was found it's uh, the closer to uh, fungus. And uh, it's, uh, it's proved under ascomycota. So let's say fungus then. Uh, the life cycle is just like parasites, you know, that's why it's, it's grouped under the parasites that it has a tropo and sporozoid uh, stage. And this uh, life cycle is common uh, in uh, protozoa. You know, if you talk about malaria, you have like tropozoid, sporozoid, it's just like that. So, but it's, it's a fungal uh, disease and uh, it, it creates a cyst in the lung, and in the brain. I mean, in the lung, so not brain here. So, the epidemiology uh, focuses uh, mainly in patients with uh, uh, immune, uh, immune system. So, typically, the child patients. By the way, it was first isolated uh, from. Uh, uh, child patients. PCP, have you heard about PCP? Pneumonitis, kernel pneumonia, so you know, HIV was discovered uh, in America in 1980s and uh, they discovered HIV after the isolation of this uh, pneumocystis, pneumocystis, that's pneumocystis carnage that by that time from five They are uh, severely sick and uh, they isolated this uh, uh, pathogen, this fungal pathogen. Of course, it was previously isolated by, from like from neonates and the likes, but uh, later it was found that it was associated with HIV because once they isolated this uh, the pneumocystis, pneumocystis carni, carni, and then they looked for the disease. And then they found out that those uh, patients, so the homosexual men, the five homosexual men were infected with, uh, with the virus. So then uh, it was the time that uh, the HIV was discovered. And uh, this, this uh, fungus was associated with the first HIV cases, okay? So that's how it goes. And so it's associated with the immunocompromised people like HIV patients. Now, thanks to ART, anti-retroviral therapy, you know, you know the, the incidence of uh, PCP is, in, is decreasing because of that. So there is factors when a CD4 count is less than 200 cell per microliter, then the, there is a predisposition, but as I say, the priority is there now, the CD4 cells will be improved. What are CD4 cells? As I you each other's number. CD4 cells. What are CD4 cells? Okay, Mina Granitsky. Telpers, exactly. So, Telpers, Anna, yeah. yeah. So, you know, CD4 cells are Telpers cells, and they help every arm of, arm of the immune system. We have the macrophages to engulf the pathogens, but for the map, the macrophages to function, they need to be supported by CD4 cells. We have cytotoxic T cells like to kill uh, intracellular pathogens like viruses, but for cytotoxic T cells to function well, they need to be supported by T helper cells, CD4 cells. You know, T helper one and two. Uh, so CD4 cells are really important, uh, T helper one. So if these helpers are, are attacked, then uh, every arm of the immune system will be like uh, disabled and uh, that will uh, predispose for opportunistic mutations. So when the, their number decreases, it's serious uh, and causes, uh, it predisposes for uh, opportunistic mutations, prior PCP, oral trash, oral trash, we talk, this caused by what? Candida albicans, and then it happens in immunocompromised people, so they are uh, interrelated. 
recurrent bacteria pneumonia and uh, the likes can predispose uh, predispose to uh, pneumocystis high hiv viral load you know it bizu virus bedem ust qal hiv patient to still cd4 count un selam ikanis they will be uh, more susceptible to pcp to the pathogenesis there is so called major surface glycoprotein msg on the surface of pneumocystis gerovesi and then it acts as an attachment ligand to the epithelial cells and there is a procedure once inhaled it bypasses the defense of the upper respiratory tract deposited into the alveolar space and then uh, it causes the manifestation so and without treatment is really really very fatal the clinical disease we have pneumocystis pneumonia previously it was called pneumocystis carney pneumonia pcp nowadays some of the the you know the mycologists or the the clinicians they call it as pneumocystis gerovesi pneumonia but to avoid the conf the confusion the term pcp has been you know continued to be used so yeah so pneumocystis pneumonia or pcp is normally caused by what pneumocystis gerovesi and uh, it's a common cause of pneumonia in its patients mm, and there are manifestations and without prophylaxis pcp develops in approximately 70 percent of adults with a child you know and 40 percent of infants and uh, there is also extra pulmonary pneumocystis pneumocystosis Pneumocystis is a fungus, pneumocystosis is a disease, and uh, it occurs predominantly in patients with advanced HIV infection. So let's talk about laboratory diagnosis. Uh, uh, unlike the other fungi we discussed, it's difficult to culture pneumocystis gerovesi on, uh, on uh, mycology media it cannot be cultured so we have to use other diagnostic methods like molecular assays to detect the, the fungus or uh, assistance or tropozoites can be uh, um, detected from the from the sample uh, so they the sisters form inside the lungs and there are also tropozoite stages so that those processes they happen inside the lungs, you know, in the in the lung area, so cystic or tropozoites can be uh, detected. But we cannot detect, we cannot isolate the fungus uh, pneumocystis gerovesi directly because it cannot be cultured on a uh, mycological medium. So immunofluorescence staining is another important. Uh, Diagnostic method, so you know it's a special staining, and histopathology can also help. Lung biopsy can be taken, and after staining with silver, uh, you know you can uh, demonstrate uh, pneumocystis gerovesi organisms in the tissue, but you know you cannot culture the treatment. Treatment may be initiated. Uh, before definitive diagnosis is established, this is important. So we said this uh, PCP is really uh, very severe. So you don't uh, need to wait uh, the laboratory diagnosis. You don't win really, because the organisms actually persist for days or weeks after the start of treatment, and uh, so the laboratory diagnosis can be done. So if you are sure based on the clinical grounds you might initiate uh, treatment so the drug is trimotoprim uh, sulfometaxol this is given for uh, bacteria but you use it here and you have also uh, pentamidine so the regimens uh, there are regimens so you also lela regimenoch menamna allo malatno nasu new later nam tumarwacho PCP, uh, prophylaxis is important for PCP. Prophylaxis uh, is really important, especially for HIV patients. 
whenever uh, uh, the CD4 count is less than 200 cells per microliter, or if there is a history of oropharyngeal candidiasis, these are risk factors we discussed already. So in that case, uh, uh, prophylaxis should be given. And uh, the most important uh, drug given as a prophylactic agent is a uh, primotoprim sulfometaxolytin. What does prophylaxis mean by the prophylaxis? Let's key the last question. It could be oh, from my side, I mean, what's prophylaxis? Prophylaxis. Yes, uh, thank you, Bro. Yeah, so it should be given before establishment of that. Yeah, yes, exactly. It should be given before uh, the infection. So this is to prevent infection. Uh, prophylaxis could be like like immunoprophylaxis. In that case, the vaccines could be given as a as a prophylaxis, but the drugs can be given also as a preventive measure. That's a prophylaxis for for example for HIV. Uh, you can be profile can be taken for malaria, for example. I'm sorry, in Addis, there is no malaria. If you, if you are supposed to travel in the malaria area, then you can take the drugs as a prophylaxis. So that's uh, the way you answered it. Thank you, guys. So, yeah, this is all about uh, today's lecture, but. Uh, you have to read also. There are other opportunities for disease like mucormycosis now, it's increasing. And uh, with the uh, uh, COVID uh, pandemic, it was really associated with a uh, high mortality in India. So it's uh, for the sake of time that I am not covering it here, but you have to read it. In India, most of the people were dying because of mucormycosis. They have actually, they have had COVID-19, but the, the cause of this was mucormycosis. So this uh, this uh, caused by zygomycetes, and now it's really increasing. Uh, I have to read. You have to know about this. You have to know, and I, I will uh, include some points in the exam, so you have to read it. Um, so thank you very much. <laughs> it was difficult, uh, really, to go through the materials and the online is really difficult, but uh, we did it. Hmm? Next time, I hope you will not ask me to do the same way. <laughs> or do you like it? Okay, any questions? Any questions in the end? Yeah, Brooke, exactly, yeah. So whenever there is organ transplantation, you know, the immune system will be debilitated because, you know, the normal organs, uh, they are important for the production of the TCS and the like. So when uh, someone receives uh, an organ, then that will not be uh, functional as the previous one. So there will be immunocompromisation. And that's why it's predisposed to fungal infections, exactly. Any other questions? Later uh, in the future, we'll see you in person, you guys, and uh, thank you for attending. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, yeah, so uh, if you can, uh, this one, uh, you can read, uh, you know, from the internet. It's like a new uh, uh, fungus. So it might not be covered on books. So you you, you can just read on the on the internet. There's different literature can be searched, and then it could be like. Let me say you can just uh, why why people were dying, why people were dying with mycormycosis in India. Then if you say just like this, you will see the materials over there, and you, you will have a no hope about that. So we have to reach. I will suggest that. Because we have Murai and Zalikas, but I don't think this uh, is covered. It's uh, a new uh, 
manifestation. Okay, see you guys. Uh, thank you very much. I will share the slides with uh, Johanna and you will get all the, all the material from there.